We're just trying to change the world here, people. Oh, really? Welcome to O'Reilly Radio 137C, recorded Friday, December 23rd, 2016, where we dismantle the current events for your edutainment through mostly rational conversations that make you go, oh, really. I'm your host, Andy Cowan, and I've got my usual suspects. I've got Stephen Griffith and Fred Sims. Welcome back, gentlemen. This is our Law and Order segment. If you have uh, any questions, comments, or concerns, please direct them to O'Reilly Radio Podcast at gmail.com or phone them in at 470-222-6759. All right. <clears throat> so I guess we're just going to you know, uh, pull the bandit off, and we're going to talk about abortion. Trying not to scream. Just, uh, hey, look, abortion. Ohio, uh, you know, the, uh, the home of Governor Kasich. Uh, hang on, there's about to be some horrible... Controversial. There it is. Ha <laughs> ha. Sort of almost made it. Okay. Obviously, there's an autoplay video on some of these links, so I try to try to nip those in the bud, but curse them. Okay. So, Ohio passes a heartbeat abortion bill. Heartbeat. The state's current law bans abortions after a fetus has begun its 20th week of gestation unless a doctor determines that the fetus isn't viable outside the womb. Exceptions are made if the pregnancy puts the woman's health at serious risk. What happens next for the bill, um, the heartbeat bill itself, would ban abortions in the state from the moment the heartbeat of a fetus can be detected, which is about six weeks into pregnancy. So we go from the 20th week or so to six weeks. Yeah. So what happens next for the bill, which would prohibit post-heartbeat abortions, even in cases of rape or incest? Now I see exactly why you were screaming internally. Uh, depends. Besides the six weeks, yeah. Yeah, depends on Republican Governor John Kasich, who, after he receives the legislation, has 10 days to decide whether to veto it. Now, this was on Wednesday, December 7th. We are past the 17th. And it was updated at 2.50 p.m. Oh, no, it was updated at 2.50 p.m., December 7th. So, what happens? As, did it Well, did it go as through? of yesterday, according to Jezebel.com, uh, they are still trying to pass it. It has not passed yet. Uh, okay. It said, uh, I'll actually link the article in there. Let me... So there's, a, there's also one. another bill in the works. This might not be the only abortion restriction law to reach K6 deaths this month. Senate Bill 127, that's Ohio Senate Bill 127, would prohibit abortions at the 20th week of gestation, except for those necessary to prevent serious health problems for women. Wait, would prohibit abortions at the 20th week. But isn't that already the law? Yeah. Oh, it, it's a general ban on abortions after the fetus has begun its 20th week. So it's the same law. Why are they doing a law that's the same? There must be something else in there. Unless they just don't know their own laws, except those necessary to prevent serious health problems for the women. Um, maybe that's the... Also, you know, restricting it to, you know, incest and, and rape, you know. Nope, you still can't do it for that. Unless somehow the, the baby is going to somehow kill you. Well, yeah, because remember, you know, that's God making sure that you have a baby. God's putting it there and wants you to have it. Right. All right, so the difference as I'm reading it between the two, and and I think what happened here is, um, and, and I... Um, Amber might be a little bit more versed on this because I remember her posting something. So what I think happened here is both of these bills ended up um, being presented. They were not able to pass the heartbeat bill, but that's because 
they were essentially throwing it out there as like, a, this is the worst case scenario. Let's just go with this 20 week one. And so what happened was the law previous was they, it was a general ban on, um, the abortion of a fetus after the 20th week of gestation, except in the case where a doctor has said that the fetus wouldn't be viable, um, through the entire term. So in this current ban, that no longer matters. They would just make women have stillbirth or, you know, that, that type yeah. of scenario. They would carry this child all the way once they hit that 20th week. You're no longer able to terminate regardless, you know, except for those necessary to prevent a serious health problem for the woman. The problem is once you get these type of things in place, how many, um, let's say, of those Catholic-run hospitals or situations um, are going to say that this is a serious health problem for the woman. Well, Catholic-run hospitals, they don't want to do, do them anyway. You know, that's, that's mm-hmm. their thing. Um, <clears throat> now, I was, I was just curious, you know, given that, uh, you know, even in cases of rape, you know, um, I was curious because there are some states that allow the rapist to gain visitation rights to their child, which is yeah. probably the biggest insult ever to the mother. Um, and states requiring a conviction to block parental rights. Oh, look, Ohio is among them. So there's a... I'll just uh, put a little link out here, because apparently this is actually a current article. CNN.com. Uh, parental rights rapist explainer where rapists can gain parental rights it's a whole thing on it and it was actually put out on my birthday this year november 17th um fun so i'll I'll just put that in here just as a as another thing to to add in insult to the injuries so you can find that in our show notes for 137 c the law and order edition here Oh, yeah, that's fun. So let me look at that uh, Jezebel article that that you put in there. So, okay, I'm disappointed, and many members of the caucus are disappointed. We're still facilitating conversations with a lot of our members in the caucus to see where we go. So 56 legislators, they need 60, voted in favor of the heartbeat bill. Two members absent that would have voted for the bill, uh, though it's not clear that every House member who voted for the bill will vote to override the veto. Are they thinking that it will be vetoed? Well, if you need 60 and you had 56 and you add 2, that's still only 58. So unless you're going to clone oh, two people... wait, wait, wait. Okay, earlier this month, Ohio Governor John Kasich vetoed the so-called heartbeat bill. Right, that he actually be- vetoed it because they had the twenty-week p- ban in place. So it that heartbeat bill was a red herring entirely. Well, no, the the heartbeat bill pushes it back to six weeks. Right, but what I'm saying is, is that there's no way that that heartbeat bill would have ever survived a legal challenge through the Supreme Court. Right. So that bill only goes into effect until the first person challenges it. It gets yeah. where it needs to go and goes in front of the Supreme Court, at which yeah. point they're going to uphold the previous, you know, rulings and it's going to get cut down. Yeah. So Roe you, v. Wade, people. you throw that one out there and while that one's out there and people are looking at that and worried about that, you tweak your current 20 week ban to it do what it does now where it no longer gives viability as an out. And that passes, and then once you've got that passed and you've made the choice, you know, the the switches you want to make, you veto the heartbeat bill and you pull that back. Mm. Now, like we're seeing in North Carolina with greedy Republicans in HB2, you have greedy Republicans that are like, wait, why can't we have both? And they're looking at over overturning the veto when your Republican governor is like, hey, we got what we wanted. Now they're just overreaching for more. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, that uh, that tells us what we need to know. So, um, 
Let's see. States that are off the list of places to move to. Uh, Ohio. Ohio. Definitely North Carolina is way off the list. South Carolina is not looking so hot either. Um, like you said, Pacific hey, you know Northwest. Washington. Washington State, yeah. Washington. Now I think, was it Maine also, I believe? They just passed recreational marijuana. Oh, did they? Yeah, okay. they did. Uh, in a recount. Oh. Is so it was it, there, but in a recount. Okay. They were too stoned to get the first count correct. The hell happened here? Okay, so... There we go. Okay. So, <clears throat> now, since we were talking about abortion, let's talk about very late-term abo- abortions. Uh, <laughs> very late 800th term. trimester. The 800th trimester, yeah. Uh, so we're talking about death row, ex- actual executions. Um, the death penalty. So Supreme Court... Uh, executions are off for those on death row. Uh, this is in was out on Delaware Online. Um, court's decision to vacate police killer's death sentence will extend to others on death row in Delaware. So 12 men on Delaware's death row will no longer be executed after the state Supreme Court found its ruling declaring the state's death penalty law unconstitutional should be applied retroactively. The unanimous 15-page decision released Thursday only mentions the state's youngest death row inmate, Derek Powell, but will apply to all the defendants sentenced to death. They will now be sentenced to life in prison without probation, parole, or any other sentence reduction. Brendan O'Neill, the state's chief defender and Powell's attorney, Patrick Collins, applauded the decision. Of course they would. Um, so, uh, one thing that we've not really touched on in great depth is the death penalty on this show. We've mm-hmm. typically been pushing it back, saying, that is a show in and of itself and needs more time. I think that that's still the case, but uh, I will put it out there right now that I have been of the mind previously that there are certain things that putting someone to death for seems to make sense. And it certainly applies to that sense of justice that some people have um, and that I have had myself. I don't know that I would necessarily force someone to, uh, to be put to death, but I do find it fascinating that in order to be put to death in any state that I know of, you have to be in perfect health. Uh And you can't have a cold or anything to die. And that that just seems weird. It's like, you're going to kill him. I mean, he's got the flu. He'd probably prefer to die. I've had some really bad flus. You know, but then I guess he's getting what he wants, and then you can't can't have that. That's part of the whole punishment thing, I suppose. But it, it's um, I suppose the death penalty really comes around, uh, you know, from that eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, Hammurabi code, and kind of atmosphere, and, and you know the the whole idea of an afterlife, and you know getting to eternal uh, punishment or retribution or, you know, whatever that happens to be, depending on your faith choice. In in particular, I've evolved on the issue, as many politicians have evolved on other issues, uh, and I, I don't think that it is something that we need to do. What I would much prefer to do, though, is allow anyone that has a life sentence in prison a suicide pill. I w- I think that, you know, don't put them on suicide watch. Let them die. There is a very small cost. <laughs> you know, just from, from the cruel calculus of it. You know, that's, that's what it is. It, this is not really talking about, you know, the humanistic mindset of it yet. We will get to that. But just from... 
And this is, of course, only my opinion. This is not the opinion of any of the other panelists on, on the show in any way, shape, or form. This is just me. I, I feel that if you're going to put somebody in prison forever, it's going to cost us a bundle. And that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So, if they find it intolerable, which many people would, then let them let them end it. You know? Give them that simple choice. Many people are never, ever going to make it outside those walls. Like these guys. On death row. They've been sentenced to death. Now they're not going to die. They have Many of them have probably already come to terms with the fact that they're going to die. And now, I mean, in a twisted kind of way, you have now taken that away from them. That would be a really interesting countersuit. It won't happen, probably. But it would be a very interesting countersuit. And it would bring a lot of interesting things up. But I just, I think that also from a human standpoint, you know, now getting into that, should we not allow people to determine when their life is at an end? They are no longer useful to society. They have been deemed by the government to no longer be a benefit to anyone in society and have been put away and they can no longer seek any f further fulfillment in their own lives. I mean, if there is a, if there is a small, a small time penalty that they're going to pay, you know, 10, 15, 20 years, 30, you know, however long is appreciable to, to whatever, um, uh, crime fit, you know, let the punishment fit the crime kind of thing. Then sure, that they, they can be rehabilitated. They can, you know, go go to the law library and and all sorts of things and self enrich to their heart's content. We do allow that. You know, even for prisoners, we allow them to do that and get degrees and all sorts of things. You know, we if you want rehabilitation, then you should allow that. If they are never going to get out, then. Give them one other door to go through. That's my opinion. I don't know if it meshes with any of your other opinions out there. And hey, go ahead and send us an email. One, you know, once we get enough of uh, enough feedback here, and and you know, another case like this pops up that we get to talk about, we'll do a whole we'll do a whole special on it. But um, guys, what do you think? What do you think of, of the death penalty in general? Personally, I can say for it is used too liberally. Um, I think in this country, for the most, only the most absolute heinous of crimes, I'm like okay. And those ones, I can see it being applied like okay. But in most cases, I think honestly, they don't need to be applied. Death penalty doesn't need to be sought in a lot of cases. Also, I have to look at the fact that just as a straight out like cost estimate. Um, the general cost of cases where the death penalty is not sought as a potential punishment is around $740,000 for like really high crimes. Mm -hmm. Ones where they are sought, it's an average about $1.26 million. Uh, just to, to give you some context, in 2013, um, there are... There were 2,979 people on death row in that year. 39 were executed and 31 died of natural causes, suicide or murder or other by other inmates. But roughly 3,000 people on death row uh -huh. in 2013. Now, when you were talking about the cost you were talking about just the cost of the case itself, right, Stephen? Yeah, that's just the that's the information right there is just from the trial. Right, but that makes sense because in a case where you're not considering death row, there are going to be steps that you're not going to go through because one, if you're 
if if death row is a consideration, so like what's going to happen is in the case you're going to go through your trial, and then the jury's going to deliberate, and the jury's going to come down with a sentence, and then once that sentence is determined, then they need to determine whether or not you know they're going to go for death or not. You know, it's like are you guilty or not? If so. Are we moving for death or are we moving for life in prison? It's two separate steps. So the case is going to be longer and thus going to cost more money when you've involved the death penalty versus when you've not. You also True. have all the appeals. Again, looking at that, uh, a Forbes article, which I will go ahead and link in here. Mm-hmm. Uh, let Typically me do that there before are, I go further. There, where, I, I don't know there, what the there. numbers are. Let's see. Let's see if Google knows. Yeah, maybe, Give me one second here. Uh, this Forbes article I just linked came out in 2014 showed that, um, quoting from it, it costs more to house death penalty prisoners as well. In Kansas, housing prisoners on death row costs more than twice as much per year as for prisoners in the general population. In California, incarceration costs for death penalty prisoners totaled more than $1 billion from 1978 to 2011. Uh, total costs outside of incarceration were another three billion. Do they and by the numbers, the annual cost of death penalty in the state of California is one hundred and thirty seven million compared to the cost of lifetime incarceration of eleven point five and see this is this is something that I was going to bring up when Andy was talking because it's it's something that's always bothered me mm-hmm. is that's always the argument is that it's more expensive to kill someone in with the death penalty than it is to essentially hold them for life. And I've never understood how that's the case. Yeah. And so, being on this show um, in, in the time that I have, one of the things is, is it makes me um, look more like you're saying, l- look at the money, follow the money, look at those type of things. And then the other one is to be slightly more cynical in terms of being presented information. So when you present me with that information, you know, obviously I'm not, I'm not holding you accountable for it, Stephen, but I would like to know a breakdown of why. Because when, like, let's say we have billions of dollars missing from the Pentagon, and those are numbers that can just be reported as, sur- as such, if you have these government-led prisons or jails housing inmates saying, oh, to house a death row inmate, it's going to cost us this much, and then the government is kicking in their portion, you know, towards funding, Mm -hmm. obviously those numbers are going to be a little bit higher, but I need to know why it costs more. And and here's the reason, um, because I have known, personally, men on death row. Um, Florida just also overturned its death penalty it's now un- unconstitutional in the state of florida the death penalty oh i didn't know that florida today ran How did a, i miss that florida today ran a story um on the main page when this happened the the gentleman that was on the cover his name was vatis kirkman mm-hmm. brevard county jail i spent all of my two and a half years in that jail with him i know him personally he made me a birthday card for a previous birthday of mine you know i i, I knew him um he was in the jail so he wasn't costing that additional amount. You, you know what so I'm saying? So he was, he was in general population. No, he was in the maximum security wing of the jail, like a 300 pod, which is where uh, essentially the more problem children, if you would. Mm-hmm. But it's also where like the people that came back from prison on appeal, he had not been sentenced yet. Um, but his crime was serious enough that the potential for extra security, that's where he ended up. But some of the people that were in that same area had come back from prison on death row appeals. And so I had known other people um, that were on death row. Um, you, obviously, there's precautions and things that you, you need to do with them. And they're generally housed alone. But it's not costing the jail anymore to house them. They're, you know, it's that's not. Actually, that's actually the argument is that it does. But they're. Well, they're comparing it to somebody that's just in general population that may have cellmates. These individuals are, also had cellmates. They did? Yes. They were not single housing in okay. our jail. They were in there with other people. Okay. And so that breakdown is still the same. You know, like for me, I'm looking yeah. at those things. Um, it, it doesn't cost the jail any more for me to put that inmate in full restraints before we walk him down to medical for a checkup or, or something along yeah. those lines. It's not costing the jail anymore. I'm already there. You're already paying me my rate. My rate doesn't go up for walking him down to medical. I, I don't think that that's, though that's the way it is in Florida, 
I don't think that's the way it is around the country. Right, and that, that's why I'm saying like I yeah. would need to know because I've, what I'm basing this off of is obviously my own personal experience. Yeah, but my and, personal and that's, experience, and, but that's valuable because it is personal direct experience. Right, and and my personal so. experience doesn't go into the prison system, so I don't know yeah. because when I look at it honestly. I know my experience from the jail, but when I go to the prison mindset, because I never worked in a prison, what I see in my head is along the lines of like a green mile situation. Okay. Yeah. And so in a green mile situation, you have your death row inmates. And most likely this is how most prisons are going to be set. They're going to be set away from the rest of your population. Yeah. They're going to be set off to themselves. They may be housed individually one to a set, but in that, in that situation, your prison was built and established for a certain amount guaranteed the number of inmates you have in that prison is over the amount the prison was built for. Yeah. So you're spending a certain amount per inmate, but you're over the, the, the max population of that prison. Yeah. You're running in a surplus. You're spending a certain amount, but you've got more bodies in there. So it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. I'm sure that there's a bean counter out there that would probably have something to say about that. Now, there's there's a website, deathpenaltyinfo.org. It's a think tank. It's obviously bent towards getting rid of the death penalty. That is their bias. But they have statistics that they show this. So just as an introduction, the length of time prisoners spend on death row in the United States before their executions has recently emerged as a topic of interest and debate around the death penalty. The discussion increased around the execution of Michael Ross, a Connecticut inmate who had been on death row for 17 years and has been spurred by the writings of two Supreme Court justices who have urged the court to consider the issue. Uh, death row inmates in the U.S. typically spend over a decade awaiting execution. Some prisoners have been on death row for well over 20 years. During this time, they are generally isolated from other prisoners, including from prison education and employment programs, and sharply restricted in terms of visitation and exercise, spending as much as 23 hours a day alone in their cells. This raises the question of whether death row prisoners are receiving two distinct punishments, the death sentence itself and the years of living in conditions tantamount to solitary confinement, a severe form of punishment that may only be uh, used for very limited periods for general population prisoners. Moreover, unlike general population prisoners, even in solitary confinement, death row inmates live in a state of constant uncertainty over whether or not they will be executed. For some death row inmates, this isolation and anxiety results in a sharp deterioration in their mental state stat, uh, status. <clears throat> so it's... Um, and while and, and they're pulling these statistics from the uh, the Bureau of Justice st statistics. And while I will yeah. not argue that being in solitary can definitely affect the mental well being of um, a, a human being, there are several things to take into consideration. One, a lot of people that are on death row generally may not have the best mental state to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, two. The argument that they make that solitary can only be used um, in a limited amount of time for the general population, that's inaccurate. Now, again, my information is only my information, but there were people that we had in solitary confinement um, that were there for almost the length of time that I was in the jail. And these particular individuals... And, and what, was that, what was that length of time, just to give... I, two, and a half, two and a half years. Um, wow. Wow. Yes. And so some of these people, but what, obviously what they would have is, um, the majors and the commander and the lieutenant, you know, continually monitored. They would come down. They'd have them meet with, um, mental health, uh, the, the mental health staff that we had at the jail and kind of track and, you know, see, do they feel comfortable bringing them out to general population? Are they in that? are in that uh, that place how is the solitary confinement affecting them mm -hmm. you know and there were situations that those people um never made whatever baseline and unfortunately my pay grade wasn't high enough to know what that baseline was um if they told us we were moving them to general population that's what we did and you know so there were people that when i got there um were on solitary like a direct watch situation for months and then he went to a state hospital. They put him on some meds. He came back, completely different person. But then there were also ones that they stayed in solitary for, you know, a year and then went to prison. And at that point, 
Who knows? Yeah, yeah I don't know what they did or, or how they handled the housing. Hmm. So it, it's not a situation where, you know, what they're looking at may be specific to the one place they studied. Well, th- this is uh, this is an average of right. the overall prison population in the United States. And so, you know, like there are just other things, in, in my opinion, to take into consideration, like those those type of things. Those are interesting numbers, but it doesn't exactly tell me how that raises the cost for housing that one particular inmate versus housing any, any other inmate, with the exception of they're generally going to be there a lot longer, you know, which is where I get into the argument of that cost per day should be, you well, know. I think it's it's probably higher than just an average anybody else. Well, if you're looking, you know, at, I mean, sh- there are other people that are certainly in those cases where right. they are in solitary confinement. They are they are hitting those high water marks of of you know needing extra care. But if but you're, they are always going to be in an extra care situation just by being there, right? The jail or the prison in in that case, they're not hiring or spending additional monies for that extra care. They're just utilizing what they already have. Well, it's kind of put into into the mix, but had they not been there... I don't even think it's put into the mix, based off of, of, of what I know. It's mm-hmm. you utilize what you have, and if, like, let's say on a given night, what you have is three people aren't able to come in, you take from the general... You're just, you're utilizing though that first. You're going to cover that first, and then the other places are where people are going to, it's going to fall off, that you're going to have less coverage. Hmm. Um, so you're not ever taking from that or bringing people in. Like, you're not going to bring someone in to work overtime for that area. If you absolutely need it, they're going to be in the general population areas, because your overtime shift is going to be somebody who's already worked, mm-hmm. who, who's going to be in a situation where maybe he's not you know, like maybe his energy's lower or he's, he's worked this shift. Now he's picking up this extra one and he has to come right back and work another yeah. shift. So you don't want that person in what you are saying is, is a more risky high security area. You want them in what is going to be considered safer, you know, so that if they have that lapse, it potentially doesn't cost them or someone else their life. Um, because of that situation. Well, so, I don't, I don't know necessarily that. You know, we'd have to find, you know, a really interesting breakdown of all this. And and if anybody out there that's listening happens to know somebody that is an expert on death row inmates and the way that culture works and, and how it all uh, works within the system, you know, let us know. I would love, absolutely love to talk to them so that we can get the real in- information on it from a subject matter expert. Uh, just with, with this, you know, a lot of people that are on death row, they're... You know, we, we see that their mental condition may be, you know, starting to decline um, the longer that they're in solitary confinement. That's just kind of a human thing. You know, we, you know, you put us in a cage, we don't react very well. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're violent. Right. You know, they may just, they're in that room, whatever, it, whatever cell it happens to be, because of why they're there. You know, because it's death penalty. It's not because they've been a danger to themselves or others in the in the situation of being in jail. It's because of what their sentence was. So they are always going to be at that higher tier. And a private room costs more. You know, it is, it is a facilities and infrastructure thing. You know, whether or not you're going to have somebody there that's that's absolutely has to babysit them. It's not a one on one thing, right? Um, no, I mean in, in most scenarios, like not in that you you'll probably have a couple different um officers or, or guards in the in that scenario yeah. where they're working on a rotation or they're working together, um, you know, and they they do the uh the watches, but it, you're not gonna have one to one um if you've got six guys on death row, you've got six officers in that in that area. You probably have two, maybe three. It just depends on who you've got down there. Yeah. And the longer they're there, I mean, you know these people. Um, yeah, the habits. My, my, my thinking on when you're looking at cost, and, and honestly, it may be um, a skewed way that cost is being looked at. And, oh, yeah. and, and this is this is 
kind of what I'm saying. It's clever if, accounting one way or another. Yes. You, know, you can make so, make numbers go go here or go there. When you're saying that on death row you've got, you know, an average of 10 years and as, some as many as 20 yeah. that are waiting. So you've got 10 and well, 20 no, years. In, in excess of 20. In excess of 20 yeah. that are waiting. Um, and you've got that number. You're looking at in excess of 20 years, that total cost plus then the cost of the actual execution, which they always say is, you know, this exorbitant number of, you know, because you have to pay yeah. those types of things. I so think you it's can, a legal fee. So you combine that together and that is going to be a high cost. But then you look at like, what is the average prison length stay for general population? And you're looking at numbers that are only like eight years for the violent offenses. Mm-hmm. Um, those <laughs> numbers are never going to match up because you're basing it off an average of 20 plus years versus the cost of an average of eight years. Well, I think that the if you're doing the numbers right, then you're comparing like to like. Right, which So it, you'd be comparing the cost somehow you're breaking, you know, that they have to track uh, expenses, you know, one way or another. So whatever clever accounting is being used to figure out this is how much this prisoner is worth. You know, whether it be how much it how much it costs to house them, how much money we could get out of them, yeah, you know, because that's the other thing. Right, they are not a useful prisoner because they cannot be used for labor. They cannot be. They can't go to the library. They can't check books out. They can't do these things. They're heavily restricted. I mean, that may be different. You know, in you know case to case basis. You know, some you know there is a bit of discretion. That right. is allowed within those walls, but overall, the the story that is being reported to whatever bureaus are are collecting the data are that they are heavily restricted. They're not allowed to to be in general population, and if they are, then they're possibly a danger because you know things happen to people that who knows what their case might be, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you're trying to keep them safe from themselves and others. Not allowed to hit the library, not allowed to educate yourself, not allowed to have physical exercise very much. You know, I'm sure they at least get them out to walk sometimes, but under heavy supervision. You know, things along those lines, it adds up to being, you're spending more time managing that person. Even if it's just keeping them in a room, they're not like other people. So there's, there's an overall cost that is slightly higher at least slightly higher, just from a logistics standpoint. Where the real cost comes in is always the legal battle. Because you're on death row, you're entitled to fight for your life. So there's going to be an appeal. And they can't pay for a lawyer, so they'll get a public defender in. And so then you have a public defender that's being paid by the tax dollars, and you have the prosecutor that's also being paid for by tax dollars. And then the judge and every ancillary service around that, the just the court cost for every appeal is also lumped on top of having somebody on death row. So it's that overall on and on and on. And some of them have had, you know, oh, geez, I don't know how many appeals they, they typically get, but I've heard of more than five. And it... it takes time to do all that and then they'll have a stay because they're working on that and and then that extends their time in the prison right. that's why they're in there for so long you know and then finally no the the judgment is up and then yeah that's that and and some of them are exonerated too some of them get off because new information is found and then the people you know they they shouldn't have been there in the first place you, but that's a separate issue in this you had um, that number that said, I believe you said 3,000 as of 2013? Yeah. I would be interested to know, it, does it also have how many people had life sentences? Uh, that was a different question. So, okay, so... How many prisoners... Uh... Have life sentences in the U.S. 
Uh, okay, so other interesting facts from the report. One of every nine individuals in prison is serving a life sentence. More than 159,000 people are serving life sentences in 2012, so just a year earlier. Okay, so I mean the numbers wouldn't be, but... And 50,000 of those are serving life sentences without possibility of parole. Okay, so you're looking at, it, and again, that is an order of magnitude higher that are without parole... And then at least an order and a half magnitude because it's not going to the two orders of magnitude because it's not 300,000. Right. Um, so you're at, you know, those level of numbers different. 3,000 people that are in there for 20 years that you're adding the cost of those appeals. Yeah. You've got life without parole and life. There are appeals happening in those situations too. Maybe not as many as the sure. death, death penalty, but if you get to 20 years, and then you've lost all your appeals and they end up going through with the death penalty and killing you. But you've got 147,000 more people lasting 40 years having to be paid for every single day. Yeah. I still don't see how they can get the numbers they say death penalty is more. You know, I, death I'm penalty. I'm with you. I'm with you over that. Yeah. The, over the numbers the, over just that don't lifetime. make sense to me. And that's obviously, you know, me personally. Yeah. That I run into problems with that, you know, logically. And, and that's where I always want to see the yeah. breakdown. Like, I need to see all of that presented. And it's kind of hard to get. I would you know? say that probably the per year cost for somebody on death row is higher. Probably. Um, but, but of course, also, remember, we're, we're in a private, for profit prison culture. Yes. So having somebody that's serving life in prison, they're just serving life in prison. They're still a useful commodity. Yeah, they're useful to that profiteering prison, right? Because they're a body. They're they're a they're a number on yeah. a on a tally sheet, which is going to equate to dollars somewhere down the line. Right. So technically, they lower their overall cost of ownership. And and it also co I mean, it <laughs> since does they go are our current slaves, all the way yeah. back to what you were saying in the first place. You know, obviously the the slant of you know, who put out that report in the first place, mm -hmm. you know, they have a desire to see the death penalty eliminated. Yeah, you can um, skew the numbers. So obviously yeah. they're going to make it seem as though, you know, it's so much more expensive. And I'm not even saying that, you know, my questioning of that isn't even me saying whether or not I'm for or against the death penalty. It's just, you can't present me that number and expect me to know how many people are actually in jail or prison, how many of them now that we've looked at it and at least have an idea as of 2012, do have those life sentences, There, it, it just doesn't make logic. You can't present me those numbers and expect me to swallow them without having questions. Like, how did you get there? What are you looking at? If it is a cost per year and you're looking at a one-to-one -one general population, whether they're life sentence or not, versus death penalty, and it's just the cost per year to house them you and, know and take care of um, them. Of the four-page fact sheet report that I was able to pull up, mm -hmm. a third of one page of those pages is financial facts about the death penalty. Everything else uh, is, you know, lots of charts about uh, race of race of defendants, uh, race of victims, uh, recent studies on the race, whether or not innocence, uh, death row inmates by race. By state, so it's a lot of a lot of different things: mental mental disabilities, juveniles, women. There's a lot of other things right. that they're concerned with, and financial is just a, like a quarter of it, maybe. So it's it's not the whole enchilada. That's not that is not the hill you die on in this argument. No, is, is financial, and if somebody is, then. Dude, where's their bias? Well, it's just you know? it's it's an argument so. that you hear a lot when it's when it's being discussed, or at least it's an argument I've heard a lot when it's being discussed. Yeah, is cost. Now there are plenty of other things. Um, you know, one of the most important, and I think it gets overlooked, is the weaknesses in our judicial system in the first place that you can't always trust the conviction. 
You know, it, yeah, like you said, there are plenty yeah. of people that are exonerated, and we need to fix the flaws that we have in our judicial system and with the bias, biases that you end up seeing where, you know, there are people that end up on death row that maybe didn't get the trial they should have. Interesting. Uh, okay, so just I'll, I'll read off these uh, financial facts about the death penalty, just since that's what we're, we're on right now. Uh, defense costs for death penalty trials in Kansas averaged about $400,000 per case compared to $100,000 per case when the death penalty was not sought. That's from the Kansas Judicial Council in 2014. A new study in California revealed that the cost of the death penalty in the state has been over $4 billion since 1978. A uh, study considered pre-trial and trial costs, costs of automatic appeals and state habeas corpus petitions, costs of federal habeas corpus appeals, and costs of incarceration on death row. That's by Alcron and Mitchell, 2011. In Maryland, an average death penalty case resulting in a death sentence costs approximately $3 million. The eventual cost to Maryland taxpayers for cases pursued from 1978 to 1999 will be $186 million. Five executions have resulted. Jeez, that's not a great return on investment, guys. <laughs> you know, if you're trying to kill these people, that's an awful lot of money to get there. Uh, that's from the Urban Institute uh, in 2008. Enforcing the death penalty costs Florida, since, you know, we, we happen to live here, uh, $51 million a year above what it would cost to punish all first-degree murderers with life in prison without parole based on the 44 executions Florida had carried out since 1976. That amounts to a cost of $24 million for each execution. That is in the Palm Beach Post, January 2000. Uh, the most comprehensive study in the country found that the death penalty cost North Carolina $2.16 million per execution over the costs of sentencing murderers to life imprisonment. The majority of those costs occur at the trial level. That's from Duke University, May 1993. In Texas, a death penalty case costs an average of $2.3 million, about three times the cost of imprisoning someone in a single cell at the highest security level for 40 years. That's the Dallas Morning News, March 8th, 1992. So, so it's like three times the cost. And it seems like it's a lot of what you had mentioned earlier, where it's coming in the form of courts, yeah. not in the form of housing. Right. It's, it's not on the jail prison level. It's in the courts and, and that kind of thing. And that's... Except maybe in Texas, which is odd. And that's where you get to... You need to look at the judicial system. If mm -hmm. you have found this person guilty and the jury has, you know, decided that that's what they're going to do and they've lost an appeal and they've lost another appeal and they're trying to appeal. Why? You know, and, and it's one of those things. If you're going to proceed with the death penalty. How many strikes are you going to be exactly. able to have? Yeah. So it, it's not that I'm saying they should not be allowed to appeal. But if you lost the first time and you lose the second time, you know, the, yeah. you only get so many strikes in baseball. So the same and thing how, should... And how long are you expected to, to wait in between? You know, exactly. Is it, is it a huge amount of time? Is it so, a little time? you know, like there are, that is where we need to clean up the, where the cost can be cleaned up. Yeah. You know, not in... In, on the incarceration side of things, it's it's in the initial, you know, judicial process that. Well, top soup to nuts. The the whole process is. Um, oh, I mean, yeah. There's convoluted. problems throughout. Yeah. It, it's just like that's obviously one of the bigger ones. Are, are we going through that many appeals? Because we know that, you know, that system is flawed and screwed up, and you know, like okay, we're going to give them as many chances as you know. There, there are I think a lot there's of a lot of that. I think yeah. there's a lot of that. Yeah, they, they, you don't want to be wrong when you're killing somebody. No. And and the people that have a conscience about it would rather spend the money and make sure they did it right. And that goes all the way back to the very beginning, in which you said, you know, 
where we're at with the death penalty and we are a retribution society. And I think the only reason why the death penalty exists is because no one has ever found a way other than the death penalty to make it right to the loved ones of whoever was affected by the person getting the death penalty. Yeah. We have never found a way to tell them this will make it right. Or we've never found a way to satiate the hurt and the pain they're feeling other than to say, we can kill that guy too. Yeah. And their initial emotional response is going to be, yeah, let's do that. Yeah. Yeah. And then you, you get the, the mass murderers and the serial killers and and the people that are <clears throat> truly beyond reproach. They, they are just, they're horrible, horrible individuals at every level. Right. And there's nothing salvageable there. Generally speaking, that can be seen. So like, yeah. let's say another story you have on here, Dylan Roof. Yeah. In my opinion, it presented the death penalty. You don't get an appeal. You decided to represent yourself. The information came out, and if I'm not mistaken, he admitted to it during the trial. Oh, yeah, yeah. He was rather open about it, as I recall. There is nothing for you to appeal. So, yeah. you should be fast-tracked. Your if, right to a speedy trial, I believe, is and is And, and yeah. your right to a speedy death once determined that you get the death penalty. You're not going to cost us any more money. We're not going to waste any more time on you. You yeah. are... As you say, one of the basket of deplorables, but, you know, a totally different basket. It is a different basket. And the things you have done have warranted you the ability to be sped through this process, done, game over. Because those are easier to determine. You know, like, you are proud of the fact of what you did. Yeah, that's... And and that's never- not a thing that should exist in this society. You should not kill multiple people because... They are different than you, and they represent something that you hate, and you get to be proud of it, and then live on the dime of their families, essentially, through taxes, for years before all your appeals and everything are used up. You know, so in that case, if we're going to have it, it needs to be utilized more swiftly than what we are. Oh, yeah. Um, Okay, so I'm putting... The death penalty info uh, fact sheet also in in our show notes for those that are curious. Um, no, I'll be curious. I'm going to read that probably tomorrow or the next day. Yeah, there's there's some stuff. Um, you know, there's plenty plenty of stuff, honestly, about all of this. Um, I'm not saying it's great stuff, but it is there. So, you know, educate yourself, folks, and uh, and let's uh, let's have a a, a semi rational conversation about it. You know, why not? Um, I, it's not something that we talk about a lot because it, it is one of those, it's a hot button issue. Boy, okay, so we've already talked about abortion, we, we talked about climate change, and we talked about the death penalty. Um, and of course, uh, well, you mentioned Dylan Roof, so that is the next story here. So let's, uh, let's carry on uh, real quick here. So this story is out on out on Vice, but I think everybody uh, figured it out. Uh, so Dylan Roof is guilty on all charges. A jury convicted Dylan Roof of 33 federal charges in the Charleston Church Massacre. Uh, self-avowed white supremacist Dylan Storm Roof, who we should probably never say his name again, uh, was found guilty Thursday on all th- 33 federal charges related to the June 2015 massacre at a historically black church in Charleston, South Carolina, that left nine black parishioners dead, um, including the minister and uh, personal friend of uh, Barack Obama, I believe. Uh, the federal charges consisted of 12 hate crime charges, 12 counts of religious obstruction, and nine counts of using a firearm to kill. Federal prosecutors are pursuing the death penalty for 18 of those charges. Roof, 22, stood with hands at his side and his face emotionless as District Judge Richard Gurgel, G-E-R-G-E-L, Gurgel, uh, read guilty. 33 times, Alan Bender reported for the New York Times. 
Proceedings began on December 7th after a psychiatric evaluation found Roof competent to stand trial. The jury representative of Charleston's racial makeup with three black jurors deliberated for a little over two hours before returning a verdict. Halfway through, however, they asked to rewatch Roof's confession tape. So, yeah, he confessed. He... <laughs> Yeah. So for those that remember, uh, he was taken into custody and I believe given Burger King on the way to the, to the jail. Yep. I just remember also the old saying, a man who represents himself has a fool for a client. And that's the, um, he, he didn't <clears throat> represent himself through the actual trial. He's representing himself, um, for the decision whether or not he'll face death. Oh, okay. So he actually did have a, at least a trial, um, public defender. Yeah. His, his attorney, um, they, they later on in the story, um, you know, they talk about, um, for his part, Roof's attorney, David Bruck, characterized the defendant as a suicidal loner, radicalized and motiva- motivated by things he saw on the internet, according to the Post and the Courier. There is something wrong with his perception, Bruck said. There is something wrong with what he is perceiving about reality. On the second day of the trial, Roof's mother, Amelia Cows, collapsed, said sorry several times, and suffered a heart attack. Holy crap! Not really? long after prosecutors yeah. described what they characterized as the cold-blooded premeditation with which her son murdered nine people. Roof's attorney, Bruck, tried to argue that both Cal's collapse and some of the testimony warranted a mistrial. I have a question here. Why does her collapse, his mother, warrant a mistrial? It doesn't. The judge denied the request because, no. Right. It could be viewed as... grasping at straws. Yeah. The argument could be done where it would be, because of her collapse, it could be viewed as an emotional attempt to sway the jury. Yeah, yeah. An emotional like, look, attempt look what she's to suffering already. Imagine if you have to do more to him, you know. Yeah, that's but, valid. But generally speaking, argument, but that if I was if I was his defender, that's the argument I would use at that point. Going well, there, we don't really have much else to go on. Let's give this a shot. Well, I mean, <clears> it, <throat> I, honestly, in that case, if you were his defense attorney and you came to me as the judge and you were like, "Well, look, she fell down," that might sway the the jury because they're going to think. And I'm going to be like, "Wait a minute! So you don't want the jury to take it easy on your client?" You're an idiot. Well, like, no, go sit down. Well, no, no, it, it's it's you want a mistrial, you want it to go away, right? You but know, the, or yeah. the mistrial is just going to start over from the beginning. They're just going to, yeah. you know, it's not going to erase all of the charges. It just means this trial is a wash. We're going to get new jurors and start over, mm-hmm. right? So you're you either want out of this situation, so you're hoping it goes to mistrial and you can no longer be his attorney. Or <laughs> well, yeah, there, there you could, want it further away from the perception or, or the remembrances of, of the jury members, so that yeah. maybe you know somehow you get a more lenient jury. That's never going to happen in this case, you know. Like so, yeah. I, I, I that was my because when I read that, I'm like, why would you add like yeah. testimony? Maybe, but that particular piece, like that's not going to in no way is that helping. No, no, no. It's, you know, get you a mistrial. More time. Just begging for more time. Essentially. Whatever it is, yeah. yeah. Um, and of course, you know, hey, there's those court costs and, uh, going up, you know, again and again. Well, yeah, and that's, I mean, even in yeah. here, it, it breaks down where mm-hmm. you would get the difference in court costs for death penalty versus not because mm-hmm. um, you've got the jury that went through, um, you know, the actual trial to determine guilty, not guilty, mm-hmm. um, and adjudicate him as such. And then his trial for sentencing to determine death or whatever his penalty is going to be for those counts starts on January 3rd. Um, That's a different jury. So they're going to be brought in. And now granted, I don't know what juries are being paid, but juries are paid. They're compensated for the time they miss. Not paid. A pittance. A bloody pittance. But you're still paying a, you know, more people and it's a whole nother process. I mean, that, that well, goes into it. I'm not saying you know, it makes it the difference between 400 and a million, but well, if it's, if it's going to be a, such a trial, then there's also other compensations that have to be given to the jurors because, you know, right. Cause they're going to have to be, they may have to be sequestered. They may, yeah. And if it's a, if it's a murder trial, 
They have to be sequestered. You pretty because, much have to sequester them. Yeah. So then you you have to feed them, you know, and the stay and, and all that. So once they get in the trial, once they make it past the void ear and are actually on the jury, uh, then then the costs go up. Right. You know, and but of course, otherwise it's a they're government just in action. That, they're just in the cattle call that is just a normal expense every day. Right. Well, I mean, and it's a government action. So that same yeah. Motel 6 that's going to cost me or you 40 bucks for the night is somehow going to cost the government 120 per person. <laughs> no, it's a government rate, you know. You know. Yeah. Let's well, get AAA and then, then, you know, you can pass the well, savings no, they, on to your tax They don't get AAA. They get triple the rate. I don't know. You know, that's, <laughs> that's just the way it ends up going. Yeah. And that, that's part of, you know, what I was saying earlier with, with the numbers that, you know, Stephen had brought up and you had brought up mm-hmm. is not doubting the numbers that they're saying. I just want to know how they're getting those numbers. And that's, that's something we may never know because it's, it's going to be self-reported by the state yeah, and the, that bean counter yeah. that works for the state. There's a bit of voodoo. Yes. A lot of, a lot of voodoo, really. It's like when we have the story where, you know, a place is like, oh, the Pentagon is missing $5 billion, but we have no idea what it was spent on. Oh, where'd yeah. that go? Yeah. Right. So it's, it's, a, it's along those same lines. We're never going to really know how those numbers come about. Also, for South Carolina, uh, the compensation is different by county, but as the site of Sala says, but in no event should you expect to make over $25 a day. Yeah, it's not not a lot. They're not state employees. They're certainly Which no is way. actually also one of the reasons why we have so much problems getting people to serve on juries going, okay, I have to leave my job for I don't know how long if I get picked, Yeah, and I'm getting paid this much, I can't take time off of my job to do that yeah and think about here's a hidden cost that you may not think about but in these situations when the um summonses go out for jury if you don't report and like let's say on this one these are federal charges so it's a it's going to be a federal jury you're in contempt yes you can be held in contempt and that creates a whole nother cost of you having to go to court for not having shown up if you don't have a valid reason in the first place well, that that's uh-huh. the stick. Yeah, that's the stick. I, you know, it, I'm I work at a at a at a business that takes care of us enough that if we do get jury duty, we do get paid. Yeah, I think so, I think my company pays as well, but I think they put a limit on it, which is weird because you can't tell me like like yeah. if it, it goes longer than three days, I, I there's nothing I can do. Like you're just gonna have to deal with that. I'm on the jury. Yeah. Uh, uh, my boss said I can't come back to jury tomorrow. Is that cool? Like, you guys got this? By the way, their name is. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I was your, actually. In your case, that would be that'd be a, a funny thing for them to do. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I was actually um, uh, summoned for a federal jury um, when I was working at the jail, and so I had to send my my piece back in and say, "Yeah, I, I work for the jail here in Brevard County." And they were like, oh, you don't need to come in. We're, yeah, see, uh, you're, you're back good. To an employee working in the correction system, they go, oh, that automatically disqualifies you. Yep. Sorry. It pretty much does. Yeah. But yeah, I, I just thought it was cool because I've probably gotten um, three or four summons for jury duty in my life, which I, uh, for a lot of people, you know, th- they don't even get one. Mm-hmm. Um, three of the four happened while I was working at the jail. And so it was immediate, like, oh, our bad. Like, I don't know how my hat got and put you, in the ring so many times. Yeah, and you were only there for two and a half years? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Um, That's so crazy. three of the four were immediate, like, yeah, no, we don't need you. Yeah. One of them, I actually went and sat down, and I was in the pool to go through um, Voir Dyer. Yeah. But I never made it. They either picked or they... So, like, the day ran out. I was there for the whole day. Mm-hmm. The day ran out. I never got called for questions. And then it was, call us back tomorrow, and we'll let you know if you need to come back a second day. Yeah. When I called, they didn't need me the second day. Yeah. Um, so I, I didn't ever get the chance to, to go through and actually answer any of the questions or have the chance to really be. But I got to sit in a room with a bunch of strangers for eight hours. Yeah. Which That's my thing. I've only been on the cattle call once, but I'm actually one of these people who goes, dude, I would have no problem being almost like a professional juror. Yeah. Let me go. Yeah, I would love. I love doing that part of my civic duty. Let me serve on these trials. I would love to do that. I yeah. won't say no. I'm sorry. I've got another thing coming up. If I can be there, I will do everything I can to be there because I want to as a citizen of this country. Yeah, I really think there ought to be a check mark somewhere. It's like, yes, I will be a juror. 
I want to be a juror. Please call me. Yeah, I mean, so I could get behind service, that. You know? I would definitely do that. But you then you run into the problems of our group in particular. How often do you think we're going to get disqualified? Well, that, that's that's a funny that's a funny thing. I know we're going we're going long in this segment, everybody. But you know, this is this is interesting information. So sorry, deal with it. Or you can hit next and just go on to to other things. But I I got onto a onto a jury uh, for it was a a basic. Basic case of a uh, civil suit to an airline because a woman was claiming to have a, a chronic respiratory issue because of inhalation of jet fuel fumes. Okay. A complete bullshit case. Total. Yeah, I'm like, if you're inhaling that on board case. the plane, you're not going to be the only one affected. I was yeah. going to say, were you s- waiting for the flight outside on the tarmac? Like, what? Oh, there was all sorts of just weird stuff that went on in this case. <laughs> and I'm just, really? <laughs> you, I think I got some jet fuel in there. It's like, that. none of that works. What are you even doing? And, you know, she she was even acting in the courtroom. I mean, it was... It was heavy. It was just an obvious attention and money grab. Yeah. Completely. She even got, you know, this expert testimony from some shill doctor on video and everything. And we, we had to sit through that and everything. And it was, that was really So you got to too. go through and kill this lady's dream of, of getting rich quick. I couldn't kill it fast enough. <laughs> I really couldn't because she was so bad. I hated to be on the side of a giant corporate behemoth. But really... Her story just didn't hold up. And during the, during the selection process, um, they, they ask, you know, do any of you think that you have any reason to be disqualified or be biased in, in this case? And my hand went up because I have experience, personal experience with jet fuel. Because hmm. back, back in, uh, one of my first jobs, I was, a uh, I was a line service attendant for one of the local airports, and I got chemical burns underneath my my wristwatch band when I was refilling the fuel truck with Jet A. So I yep. have I know how caustic it can be, and I have I have filled airplanes, and I have personal experience with it. And it's like I I know a thing or two about it, including the fumes. So <laughs> what I'm getting through all of that. Mm-hmm. Is that you personally know whether or not jet fuel burns that hot? Are we really go? Are we going there? Really, really? Um, jet fuel burns at the temperature the jet fuel burns, <laughs> and that iron. Was, that was a nice diversion. And iron begins to weaken in its structural integrity at a certain temperature, which happens to fall within the range. Of when jet fuel is burning. However, yeah, the greatest video we showed it here was that the blacksmith yeah. with the yep. uh, however that doesn't rebar. that doesn't tell the whole tale because if you add titanium and aluminum <laughs> and start that burning, it creates its own oxygen, and in fact, the entire plane's chassis including its landing gear, which is titanium, becomes thermite. Thermite burns hot enough to melt iron. Case dismissed. So, as soon as a jetliner happens to crash into a, into a building, it turns into a fireball that ignites itself into thermite. See, and that's why we ask these questions, people. So there you go. Does it? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Maybe so, not by itself, but once the whole jet catches on fire, boom. <laughs> so outside of the ridiculous question that I had to ask, yeah. <laughs> you raise your hand. Yeah. You explain to them that you have experience with jet fuel. Yeah. What is their response to you? Great. Now, who was who had asked the initial question, prosecution or defense? Uh, it was just an overall general question that then then they could just ask you know okay yeah you know, so who said both sides benefit from asking that question so okay. it's just a general question um and so neither side it, seemed i think both sides wanted me 
for different reasons. You know, the, the one side thought that, great, he's got experience, he's going to be on my side, because he's ex- personally experienced how bad it can be. The other side, the professional side, saying, good, he's experienced it and knows exactly how wrong all of this is. That's what happened. <laughs> So there's the perception trying right. to, you know, concoct the, the tail, and that's what screwed him. Because I actually took notes, timelines of the things that happened, and I went to the frickin' whiteboard in the, in the um, uh, whatever they call it, the deliberation room, mm-hmm. and I walked the entire jury through, here's what happened here, here's what happened here, here's what happened here, here's what happened here. That doesn't add up. She's lying. This is awesome. I <laughs> like. I I have this thing. For, I convinced three people for, on that jury to to take her, take her out. <laughs> Jesus Christ! He twelve he twelve angry men. The jury. This I is did. amazing. Like I I have this thing for for lawyer movies. I have no idea why. It was great. I love lawyer movies. I would do it all, again in a heartbeat. All of this stuff is public record. Yeah. So. We could get all of this information, at which point it would spur your memory for anything that you had forgotten. You know, mm-hmm. we need to make this a movie. Like, this needs to be a thing. It's, it's. Well, the things, the things that happen inside the deliberation room are not recorded. But yeah. yeah. But we they could, ought, we could, you know, they ought to be. Yeah, we could figure but, that out. <laughs> they ought to be, but they weren't. We just need three people to disagree with you. And then you convince them. The argument can be anything. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. We, there was, um, uh, she apparently was having, you know, chest pains and had to be on oxygen. So the EMTs, you know, from the, the local on-site fire department, because all airports have, large enough airports, have a fire department. Mm-hmm. So they ran to her aid, and every single call they have is time-stamped. It's on the reports that they gave us. It didn't match up to the amount of time she said when the incident happened, which was also time-stamped because the line crew had the issue, so they time-stamped their report when, it, when, when the fuel spill happened underneath the airliner. And it's like, no, none of this matches up. None of it. Uh-huh. Your time of travel to, you know, to here and there, and it's like, no, none of this works. It's gonna take, and I was taken into account. It's like, okay, so so she's in like the middle of the cabin. So, and by the time this happens, the entire plane is full. You know, they're already loaded up. So then she has to fight through all those people to get back out. Right. <laughs> it's like, no, none of this, none of this works. <laughs> you either prove you have some kind of medical hypersensitivity. Yeah. Or. Yeah, exactly, and and uh, apparently yawning was one of the signs of her uh, her particular type of COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder. Yeah. Right. Um, basically, you don't breathe good anymore. Uh, and yawning was apparently one of her symptoms. And she was yawning it up throughout the whole case. <laughs> Just right there in the courtroom. It's like, wow, wow. Like, big show of it. Like, complete acting yawns. Find out later from some from one of the juror alternates who was, uh, you know, once the jury was, you know, really solid and not moving anymore. Anyway, right. The judge apparently said, man, I'm glad you guys decided that way because otherwise I was going to have to overrule it because <laughs> it's all bullshit. <laughs> so, yeah. So there, there are some checks and balances at least because, uh, you know, he saw he saw straight through it, too. So I mean that's and uh, honestly uh, those checks and balances are going to be different in every every situation right. and like not every judge may do that but I mean that that for whatever reason like that kind of stuff is super interesting to me I think that's awesome like I would have loved to have any near you know anywhere mm-hmm. near something that cool even if I was one of the ones that you had to convince I'm like oh this poor old lady in that jet fuel now granted everybody oh, listening yeah. yeah oh yeah there were a couple people that were totally down on the sympathy play uh, I, oh they were totally in it but I've been a part of this show for over a year now there are people listening to this show that realize that that, that's not me i'm just saying like maybe yeah yeah like because it was me i'd be like this old bitch needs to get out like i no, like you've lived your life go more jet fuel get out you you would have done the same thing i did yeah you would have got up there with the charts the graphs and say no look how 
how it can you explain how this happened probably even without the experience with the jet fuel oh, yeah. like that it would have been that but i mean it's just no, interesting it's total, to like, me like matlock colombo kind yeah, of thing that's it's stuff, like that stuff is really cool yeah it's like okay so let's let's look at this one more time <laughs> <laughs> what are you not understanding <laughs> Yeah, I actually had to. I had to take one of the people aside, and it's like, really, you don't, you don't see how this works. <laughs> oh, it was just, it was amazing. It was, it was a lot of fun. So, really, I highly recommend people to, you know, try to be on a jury. You know, get involved. You know, this is your legal process. At the very least, you'll come back with a better understanding of how it how it is. the The judge was super cool too, because he was totally into his job. He loved being a judge. He loved the law. And he took probably half an hour just explaining the entire process that we were about to go through. And it was it was so cool. He was just an excellent judge. I can't remember his name, but I might be able to remember him in a lineup. Hopefully I never see him in a lineup. That would be awkward. <laughs> um, no, hopefully he never sees you in a lineup. <laughs> that's, tr- that's true. That's true. Either way. <clears throat> so uh, there was one more story. I'm just going to touch on it very briefly because uh, it is the evil. Uh, it is the Trump. Uh, judge refuses to cancel or limit Trump deposition. Good. So a judge has uh, refused President-elect Donald Trump's request to cancel or limit a deposition he's scheduled to give at Trump Tower early next month in a lawsuit he filed over abandoned plans for a restaurant at his new Washington hotel. D.C. Superior Court Judge Jennifer DeToro issued an order Wednesday turning down Trump's lawyer's motion to scuttle the planned testimony in the case Trump's companies filed against firms owned by Washington celebrity chef Jose Andres. Andres canceled plans for a Spanish restaurant at the new Trump International Hotel after Trump disparaged Mexicans during his campaign launch in 2015. Uh, Trump's attorney had asked that he not testify or that the session be limited to two hours instead of the usual seven. Uh, They also sought to prevent Andreas lawyers from asking questions duplicative of those asked in another lawsuit Trump filed against Chef Jeffrey Zacharain? Or is it Joffrey? Could be Joffrey Zacharain. Um, Who also backed out of plans for a separate restaurant at the same hotel. The court finds that Quote, the court finds that entry of a protective order would cause significant prejudice to the defendants by inhibiting their right to prepare the case for trial, and minimal, if any, prejudice to Mr. Trump, whose schedule for defendants have agreed to accommodate, uh, to accommodate. Okay, I guess that's a period. (laughs) The court finds that Mr. Trump has unique personal knowledge relevant to the claims presented in the instant action and has not shown good cause for the entry of a protective order. So apparently, being elected President of the United States is not significant um, issuance for a protective order. Good. (laughs) Though this is only going to be, you know, seven hours out of the president-elect's life in this one. But he's got another one, so it'll be 14 hours total. So he's, he's trying to make sure that he doesn't, ask, doesn't get asked the same questions of two different cases that are about the same thing but not related to each other. Does he, do they not know how these things work? These are mutually exclusive events. Two two cases. It's not a class action, which I guess that's what he's used to. But <laughs> if you get asked the same questions when you're Donald Trump, chances are the <laughs> answers the same answer. come out differently. <laughs> yeah. And since the deposition oh. results are public record and you've sworn uh, and he that per- presents a problem. He would perjure himself. Yes. Yeah. Perjuring himself then presents a problem for his Republican constituents because perjury is what got Bill Clinton impeached. It'd be awkward, though, to to get the, the a perjury from two cases like that. So the so the case record so that okay so the prosecuting attorney would have to subpoena the records from the previous case. 
Right, which wouldn't be difficult. No, that w- that wouldn't be difficult. But that's what they would have to do in order to have that record available, so they could then compare the and the answers to the questions. Honestly, they've probably already done it. Yeah, if well, because, if it's already been done. Yeah, yeah, if you're going to ask the same questions, if you're going to ask questions as it relates to statements made during the campaign trailer, or however you're mm-hmm. going to, you know, the questions that aren't mutually exclusive to right. what's being discussed in that particular case. Yeah. Then you're going to want to know what the answers were because when you say, did you say all Mexicans are rapists? And he goes, mm-hmm. no, I never said that. And you're like, okay, well, besides the, it's like, well, we do have video of tweet, you doing that. And yeah. besides this video <sighs> on this date and at this time at this deposition, yeah. this was your response. So I'll ask you again, did you say all Mexicans are rapists? You know, and give him the opportunity to refresh his memory, yeah. but you'll already have those answers. And if it continues down that line right. of, you know, I could say what the hell I want, then you have both of them. And yeah. that's where the perjury would come from, because in one of the two cases, he had to have lied. Yeah. And then the, and then the former case would then also be able to appeal based on the perjury in the second case. I don't know about the appeal because the former case, if I'm not mistaken, we're talking about Trump University. Oh, no, no. Both of these cases that I'm talking about oh, are, are both are related to the rest. Okay. There are two restaurateurs okay. that both canceled for other reasons, and okay. they're both being sued by Trump. I thought we were looking at depositions... Because he had sat for depositions in the university case as well. Sure. Yeah. In which case, I'm fairly certain they also asked him about. De- so that's where I thought they were. But yeah, in that same thing, that yeah. they would definitely be able to to appeal or at least pursue. Um, My so many cases. I mean, we're getting them confused. You yes. think that he was, you know, involved in some shady dealings or something? Oh, okay. you think? You think, right? So. I, I think that we've addressed these things in as close to a legal way that we can. We are not attorneys. Uh, we are merely laymen that are trying to dissect this for our own personal edutainment, and we're glad to have you along. But that does conclude, uh, conclude our notes for this version of the show, and we, um, we certainly hope that you've enjoyed what we've done here, and if you'd like to help us out, there's a few ways that we can, uh, we can beg of you to do that. You can donate to the show through patreon.com slash radio p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com O-R-L-Y R-A-D-I-O and that'll get you early access to show content uh, like the next show which should be behind uh, behind the wall for a little bit and then I'll release it on uh, on Wednesday to, to everyone else <clears throat> though it's the holidays so who knows I may just give it to you for free because Merry Christmas and all that anyway uh, also uh, you know you could give us a Christmas present by giving us a favorable review out on iTunes that'll help raise our numbers and uh, and get us in front of more people that would definitely help out and also you could tell a friend you could give them the gift of O'Reilly Radio by telling them about it and pointing them here so that we can fill their mind with all this crazy knowledge that, uh, that we're spouting about and of course you can engage us directly if you have questions, comments, concerns etc etc send us a message on social media or on the electronic mail at O'Reilly Radio Podcast at gmail.com or if you're the more talkative sort 470-222-6759 that's already always available to take your call or text thank you for choosing to waste your valuable time <clears throat> this has been O'Reilly Radio part of the Random X Company this work licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 United States license, including the music Rocket and Pemgia, created by Kevin McLeod of Incomptech.com. Thank you, everyone, and we'll see you on... maybe next Friday? Maybe? We'll see. Talk to you later. Okay, so, <laughs> we do have... Mm. other things to talk about but it is late we got a lot of traction out of that so we could probably just kill it let's see what we got for next week i i would be okay with killing it just because yeah i think we probably should i think we probably should so let's uh 
since I just said that we'll see you next time, uh, I'm going to leave this in the show and say, I'm sorry, we're not going to see you next time, but we will talk about all these other things. We'll push them out one more week uh, because, well, it's the holidays, and boy, we got a lot of, a lot of talking done um, on just those, yeah. those initial things. Good discussion, though. And I knew, yeah, I knew, of- I knew that the death penalty was going to be a whole show on its own. <laughs> I still, I still think we can delve into. <clears throat> we can like do more. A, a show on the de- because I mean, yeah. all of the things that I discussed on the death penalty weren't even my viewpoints on the death penalty. Yeah, and and really, I think, and I apologize if I did so. I think I cut Stephen off uh, uh, going through his views because. I immediately had a question about just something that he was presenting, not even his view, you know, like, so we didn't even get to that, really. So, I mean, like, we got your view, we yeah. got a tiny bit of what Stephen was going to have a view, and then I took that shit in a totally different <laughs> direction just because I had a question on those numbers and, and yeah. where that took us. Well, we're, you know? we're it's all still your here. fault, Fred. It's all your fault. Usually. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're still here, and I'm still recording. Stephen, do you have anything anything that we did not get? On that? No, again, when it comes to that particular thing, it's just simply that the, you know, because of cost, because of everything else, and because of the, my actual moral reason, forget, forget money, forget any of that, my mm-hmm. actual moral reason that I am 98% against the death penalty is because we have documented evidence, even uh, from recent times, of innocent people being executed. Yeah. And whereas in war or something else, you have what are called, you know, casualties of the conflict. You know, they just, you are going to have these regardless just because somebody's house was in the area when the, you know, when you carpet bombed it. Yeah. But when it comes to justice, I am of the opinion that, I'm sorry, if we are going to execute somebody for a crime, then they have to be guilty. Even one innocent person, we cannot withstand that. That's, that's a non-starter for me. That's how we get to Star Trek. Or we uh, just do the beef. Yeah. I, honestly, instead of Star Trek, when it comes to we take the death penalty out entirely, let's go with the B five route. How do they I handle it? Way it's more invasive. But let's do their route. Psychops? No. <laughs> uh, people who were convicted of essentially what we classify as death penalty crimes, mm-hmm. um, they would have death of personality. They would essentially be mind wiped and reprogrammed to then be of a benefit to society. Usually, they become like a monk in a monastery and do good works for the rest of their lives. Oh wow! I think so I'd like, rather you're, kill you're, him. You're a serial killer and serial rapist. You've done those horrible things. Everything else, okay? Well, we just wipe you, put a new personality in there, and now you just want to help people and do all these good things over there and help society oh. that you damaged. Wow, though, but then you've got the, all the the whole ethics of of individualness, you know, and you know you, you have killed that person by doing that. Well, and and there, typically, the only times it was used was for something like you know, you are a serial killer. There is no way to, you know, there's not really a yeah. method of rehabilitation or anything else. You just killed a couple, one person, two. Okay, you just go to standard jail, you do all that kind of problems. Treason is typically dealt with by spacing. Um, I have watched Babylon 5 enough times to know all these things. Yeah. Um, but that's but, also the military answer, you know. Yeah. Military typically really, has a different... Really heavy, different hard reaction. crimes were dealt with, typically, death of personality. Hmm. Well, in that, Whew. in that same scenario, how does one innocent person affect you there? In those scenarios, there were no innocent people. But well, that, in, obviously, in, because in it's Babylon in Battle Five scenario, there were no innocent. Well, people. yeah, obviously that because it's a fictional universe that having yeah. well, no, they, having an innocent actually, person in the show, defeats they the purpose. Had a reason showing why there were no innocent people. Oh, do you remember what it was? Yes, in order to actually have that uh, penalty brought down on you, it was required that the psychor, the for anyone listening out there, the actual yeah. government funded psychics essentially, or telepaths, typically, uh, would perform a deep scan on you to actually go through your brain and see, oh yeah, you actually did do all of those things. Okay, yeah, we have absolutely confirmed that you did do these things. Okay, now we can wipe you. 
Yeah, but you know, the Psychor itself was kind of um, quest- yeah, questionable. Um, well, I mean, you run into the same problems that you run into in, um, you know, uh, what's that um, that Tom Cruise movie with Colin Farrell? Minority Report. Yes. Yeah. You run into the Minority future Report crime, problems yeah. where the future crime, and they see him as committing those crimes, but that's because he's setting up the scenario to prove that it can be, you know, that it, yeah. it's wrong. And you get the same thing in that situation. If you have psychics that can deep probe your mind to determine if you did something, then you have psychics that can deep probe your mind to implant memories that don't exist. Like it, it yeah, it's definitely a sticky wicket. Like that's, well, it, yeah, it's always that, going that to be the problem exists. that we, we have that issue of how can we fully 100% guarantee we've got the right person. Well, yeah, with, you would also, going from a standard mundane perspective, you know, they obviously have higher capability science than we do. The funny thing is, not that much higher capability. Um, no, I mean, they're operating at the the weakness of the writer. <laughs> you can only... Yeah. <laughs> they, well, no, actually, when they went through the actual tech, like, uh, the two shows I love for tech-wise, um, yeah, Star Trek is way beyond us. Right. Uh, but... Uh, Babylon 5 and Battlestar Galactica, the new one, both operate at tech levels that, except for FTL capability, uh, really aren't that much higher than we have now. You know, a yeah. hundred years maybe, and oh look, we've got almost all of that ourselves. Yeah, though it's uh, it's certainly interesting to figure out. You know, then we get into the futurism and, and what whatever that mm-hmm. is. But you know, the, the sci-fi is is the greatest testing ground of ethics and morals. Yeah. You know, it, that's where these questions get asked. So, was that really a solution? You know, now now we get to ask that question: Was that a solution? I don't know. That's why I'm, I'm I've always been confused by, and this is kind of a different argument. But whenever you have that argument with like atheists, and you know, people will be like, "Well, where do you get your morals?" Yeah, uh, ass them off. <laughs> Are you three laws safe? <laughs> like, is this, is this what you're asking me? Like, I get my morals from science fiction because, you know, where else will I have the opportunity to determine whether or not if I have this ability, I should use it? Wow, uh, that's an interesting concept, Fred. That's an interesting concept. You know, of course, uh, really, the what the atheist answer typically is for where you get your morals, uh, morals precede religion. So, you know, they, they are part of the underpinnings of society that allows things like religions themselves to come up, you know, to emerge. Well, morals are defined by the civilization of the time. What's moral for us is well, not... Well, no, that's laws, Laws are what is defined by the civilization at the time. Morals are more basic than that, and, but and I morals don't, morals emerge from empathy. You know but, what? Like we were talking in the show before, right? But I don't you know. think that like ancient Egyptian, the morals are the same. You know, like it's not a guarantee they're the same as what we have right now. I bl- I believe probably the commoners would still wish to be treated fairly and equitably. Just what they saw as being fair and equitable would be different than what we did. But the desire to still be treated in that fashion right. would be nearly the same. Though that's what we'd need the uh, time machines for. Yes. And perhaps a lot of face paint so they don't you know, look at us weird and you know, <laughs> lock us up or turn us into a god or something like that. No, you're not allowed to go back in time and become a god. No. No, no, remember, <laughs> stars aren't right. The stars aren't right? They're one of the best lines from uh, Road Del Dorado. I'm going to have to rewatch it. No, I'm going to have to rewatch it. I don't remember it. Hmm. Let's see. Um, Sprocket. I think the main guy's trying to do a... Let's see. I'll start on the actual really uh, Facebook... Or really Messenger... Okay, and I'll I'll go ahead and uh, maybe pop that in the uh, um, in the show notes because I'm going to stop the recording now to be uh, you know fair to everyone else out there. But I am keeping all this in so that uh, because it was still germane to the conversation. Yeah. So, uh, did you have anything else on 
the death penalty. You know, obviously we can go on and on about, uh, you know, uh, pu- punishment <laughs> ethics within sci-fi. Actually, that'd be mm-hmm. a very interesting thing to talk about. <laughs> That could be like a, a special of its own section. Just here you go. Yeah. It's like, let's talk about the death penalty. Now let's talk about there, the death penalty in sci-fi. <laughs> actually, death penalty or just punishment in general, because there's a book series that I really, really absolutely love that kind of blew my mind when it comes to crime and the reasons it's committed. Um, crime and the reasons it's committed? Okay. Okay. I know what the... <clears throat> I'm trying to uh, get... Yeah, it's the Jaguar Adams books. Um, it is sci-fi. They are essentially at what essentially humanity at a certain point, murder and everything else got so bad that humanity itself kind of lost its damn mind, and so they had a time time called the serials, where literally. You could walk down the street and that you know people are murdering people left and right, or like a cop who's trying to defend you might finally have seen too much and just snap, and then just start. Well, you know this is happening to me. Then everyone's guilty, so it just starts killing everybody around them. You know, so they got that under control and decided, okay, we really need to like look at how crime is dealt with and change this. Hmm. So they essentially created. Uh, I forget what they're called, but they created orbital colonies that orbit the planet, orbit Earth, and there's three or four. Each one is indicative of a higher grade of crime. And it is very much about rehabilitation for the most part. You go there, you get sent up to one of these, and you are rehabbed. Space prisons. Yeah, but it's space prisons all hardcore about actual rehab rehab, where... It's okay, you know, you might just do some basic stuff, you might do some other things. Um, yeah, sorry, the satellite prisons are called planetoids, and the main character, Jaguar, uh, who's a girl, is on uh, Planetoid 3, which has some of the hardest uh, hard edge victim crimes and everything else. Go, people go there, and they set up entire scenarios and everything else, because it's the idea of uh, crime, especially at the higher levels, is all based on fear of something, like you know, why did you do this whole thing? Well, you know, maybe fear of loss or huh. fear of... It, they, they get really into it. Interesting. And it's really, really... I will also share this to the... Oh, really? There you go. That's the okay. first book. It's on Amazon. Okay. Um, but it's a fascinating series. And it really makes you think like, huh. <laughs> hmm. Well, okay then. Um... So that's that's in the book club for Overlay Radio, <laughs> and uh, I, I, I would, that's a book I would love for us to get together, read, and then you know drunkenly comment about. Jeez, another podcast in the works. Okay, <laughs> and I blame Amber for that. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, we can blame her for a few things. Yep. Okay, and I'm shutting it down. Vaya con Dios. Vaya con Dios. <laughs>